Hi, and welcome to week eight. We're going to start with a topic that is not usually found in NLP syllabi, but that I think should be, and that I personally find fascinating. We're going to talk about writing systems and how we need different methods of input for different writing systems. And if you're used to a writing system like an alphabet and you write something like English or Spanish, you may think that it's just a matter of hitting a key and in goes a code and out on the screen comes some display for a glyph. However, for many languages, there are more steps involved in trying to get the input of the language into the computer. You might have additional diacritics. You might have um, more than one way to write a word. We're going to look at some of those challenges here. And we're going to look at the different types of writing systems that we have for human languages. For example, we have alphabets like we use in English or Spanish. We have a system called consonantal alphabets or abjets, which is what uh, is used for Arabic and Hebrew, for example. We have a type of alphabet called a feature alphabet, which is used for Korean. We have syllabic alphabets or abugidas, which are used for languages of India, for example. example. We have syllabaries, and here are two examples from Cherokee and Japanese kana. And we have logographic systems, like the characters of Chinese or ancient Egyptian or Maya. In this first video, we're going to focus on the three first ones. Alphabets, we use an alphabet for English, so you know that it's composed of consonants and vowels. So are many other alphabets in the world, the alphabet for Georgian, the alphabet for Greek, also have consonants and vowels. One interesting feature of our alphabet is that it has both uppercase and lowercase. And these are kind of an anomaly. It's not very common for the alphabets of the world to have two different forms for the same letter where one is uppercase and one is lowercase. Most systems just have one letter. The uppercase was born because of illuminated manuscripts, as you see here. People wanted to do fancy designs for the first letter, and then that sort of stuck. They're called uppercase because they were usually stored in the upper case of typographic machines, of the printer cases. And it, this is an anomaly. It's not usual that writing systems work like this. And in order for a keyboard to work, in our languages. We couldn't fit uh, uh, all the keys necessary to have one key for the uppercase and one key for the lowercase. So we use something called a modifier key, which as we know in English is the shift key, to modify the A into its uppercase form. So if you press the key for A, you get the lowercase. If you press the modifier and the A, you get the uppercase A. This is a similar principle to what we use when we're typing diacritics. Many alphabets have diacritics, which are symbols that are above the letters, below the letters. Maybe they are attached, like the sedil for the French. Uh, see, sedil, it also exists in Turkish. As you can see, these are symbols that change the letter somehow. And this is very specific to every language. The way most of them are input is by using a com uh, something called a dead key. As you can see here, and this is what we would use in Spanish, for example, here we have the letter for the diacritic, and then we press the vowel to get the character. What this key is really doing is that it's changing the mapping of the keyboard. So if you just press the letter A, it will send a certain code. If you press the dead key, it temporarily changes the mapping so that if now you press the letter A, it sends the code for accented A, for example. If you uh, press shift and the dead key, you get these uh, two dots here, the umlaut, and you would send, and then it would change the mapping so that if you hit this key, you would send the A with two dots on top, for example. And this is the way it works in many languages that use the Roman alphabet. Uh, Vietnamese, for example, French, Spanish. You would get, there's several ways that it can be done. You can change the mapping 
so that you have one character that is graphically composed of both the vowel and the glyph, or your computer could also do something called combining characters, which is one character and then a combination of a diacritic that is set to float above or below it. And different languages and keyboard mappings use different strategies for these. So alphabets have consonants and vowels. Consonantal alphabets or abjads mostly have only symbols for consonants, and the vowels are saved for special situations. Say, if you need to read the, clear, the text very clearly in a religious uh, ceremony, for example. So this is the word lura in Arabic. The, uh, uh, the normal way to write this is just the letter L with the letter ra, and then a marker for the end of the word here, which now sounds like an a. But you don't get a symbol for a U or an A here. So you have to guess that the U goes in there, Lura. And what you can have sometimes is special glyphs, special little markings that tell you explicitly that, yes, this is an U, and the L should be accompanied by an U, Lura. Um, uh, Hebrew has these, for example. And you might think that it's strange to, to write like this. But first of all, try to write that, uh, try to read that English sentence. We could write English like this. All it takes is knowing the language and you could fill in the blanks. And it would be no different for us to, to read and write like that. And second, we also do this in English because English does not have markers for the for the prosody, for like the timing of the sentence, the rhythm of the sentence. When you read the words, you are inserting that information mentally. English is not telling you, for example, where's the strongest uh, vowel in every word. Mentally, you have to fill in the blanks. But what happened in a system like the one for Arabic is that you fill in more blanks. You have to fill in the rhythm and the vowels. One more interesting challenge of Arabic is that letters change shape according to their position. So because it's a cursive script, as you can see here, um, for example, yes, this is the letter dot. It has a shape when it's on its own here. It has a shape when it's the first letter in the word, the middle letter of the word, the end letter of the word. And there's a few that change a lot. So for example, look at uh, ein. This is when it's on its own. The first letter, the middle letter, the end letter. They're all very different. So how will the computer handle this? Internally, it does two things. First of all, each of the glyphs has uh, some piece of metadata that tells you whether it should be joined or not. So within Unicode, the characters have a metadata for the joining type. For example, whether they join only with things on the right, whether they join on both sides, whether they never join. And then Unicode has an algorithm called bidirectional algorithm, which rearranges the letters and uh, computes their correct form according to whether they join or not and what was before and after them. So internally, for example, you might hit these keys in succession, but then the computer has to rearrange them so that they go, for example, from right to left on the screen. As it rearranges it, them, it also computes the correct uh, joining form depending on its position. So if this one was in the middle and it tells you it joins on both sides, then it will search for the correct glyph for it to join on both sides. And this is behind the scenes what your uh, word processor is doing every time you hit a key. There's a third type of alphabet called a feature alphabet, which really only exists for Korean, but it's really cool. It was invented in the 1400s. So um, as you can see here, the shapes of the letters resemble things that you do with your mouth when you're speaking. For example, the M is supposed to resemble the lips. Here you have a 
k, which is supposed to be uh, to resemble the shape of your tongue when you do this. The tongue goes to the back of your mouth, k, k. And if you have, let's see, uh, where's the modified k, here. This one here has a little bar in addition to the k. So this is the k, and this is the k with a bar. And this one has an extra puff of air, k. This, this uh, happens throughout the system, where, for example, this is a T, where you, uh, this is a T, and this is a T with an extra bar, and this is also T, T, with an extra puff of air. So the line here indicates extra puff of air, and there's a difference between regular K, extra puff K, 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 regular T, extra puff T, T, T. The Roman alphabet really doesn't have this. Every shape is independent of each other. But in Korean, the shapes are uh, give you information of what your mouth is supposed to be doing. That's what we call it featural. And very interestingly for us, the letters cannot just happen on their own. They need to be arranged in squares. And there are many rules for how the squares can be formed, as you can see here. So the word hangul which is the Korean writing, needs to be arranged, not only do it need to be arranged in a certain way, not only do the glyphs need to appear in order, they need to appear in a certain position in a square. So internally, the computer uh, is doing two things. Each of the characters has metadata for where it can go. It can go in the initial position as a lead. It can go in the lateral position as a vowel or it can go in the lower position as a tail. And each of the glyphs has information of where it could possibly be. So when you, you, when you use the keyboard to input the character that corresponds to the H, what you're inputting is H and its metadata that it can be, for example, a, a leading character or a tail character. If you then hit the key for this letter, the A, is going to give you the, meta the metadata that it's for a vowel character. And so once it has these, it's going to try to compute what the possible combination of these two could be. If, for example, it receives a character that can be a tail, like the N in Han, it's going to use this equation to try to calculate the correct Unicode block for the correctly formatted block that composes all three. So in your keyboard, you have the equivalent of H, A, N, and internally the computer is trying to figure out which block it could correspond to that particular combination. So a summary so far, as we have seen, it, input is not just a matter of hitting a key. Sometimes characters can change shape as you go. For example, Arabic letters can change shape and then the computer needs to recalculate and rearrange the letters as it's typing. Maybe you'll need additional diacritics, like um, the accent in Spanish, in which case you'll need something like a death key, which remaps the keyboard onto different uh, codes. So that if you hit the, uh, the accent character in Spanish and you hit the A, you get the correctly formatted A with an accent. Sometimes characters might need to fix together in complex ways, and then you need to play around with codes to get the correct arrangement. Sometimes the direction might be different, and you might need your um, word processor system or your operating system to calculate the direction of things on the fly. In the next video, we'll look at more writing systems.